Hello, everybody. So today I am joined by Bruce McCarthy. Bruce, would you like to um, give yourself an introduction? Say hello to everybody. Sure. Um, thanks, Joe. For the last 10 years or so, I've been working with product teams around the world, trying to get the best out of them, trying to help them improve their game. And um, one of the things that I've learned is that alignment on goals and roadmaps between the uh, product team and the executive team is critical to success. You're not going to get what you expect out of your product team if they and you are expecting different things. And one of the things that I've found that is a precursor and absolutely critical for alignment there is alignment among the executive team. Uh, often I run into companies where actually the head of marketing, the head of engineering, the head of product, the head of sales, they've all got kind of different ideas of what success looks like. And so I've been spending a bunch of time over the past couple of years working to gain alignment and clarity on direction and strategy within executive teams. That's good to hear. So for the folks who don't know me, I'm Mr. Joe. I coach CEOs of both tech companies, but also larger businesses today. And why I've invited Bruce here today is to talk really about that alignment of folks within the C-suite and what that looks like when it's going well, what that looks like when it's going badly and how, effectively how we can achieve that. So my first question then, Bruce, is we talk about alignment, right? And everybody feels like they know what it means, but the reality is, is you must have had to dig into that. What does alignment mean? What do we mean by alignment? I think it's a really important concept and I'm glad you brought it up. It might sound like a synonym for agreement or consensus, but it's not actually. It's much more specific. Consensus is when everybody agrees, okay, yes, this is the best thing, best solution, the best um, decision we could make, and we're all, um, we're all going to make it work. And if you've ever tried to figure out where to go to dinner with a large group of relatives, you know that consensus is hard to come by. In fact, I would argue it's more or less impossible because the only way you get to agreement is if somebody says, yeah, I don't really like fish, but okay, fine, I'll just go along. So alignment is where you openly acknowledge that I like fish and you like pizza, but we make a group decision anyway. And we agree that we're going to pursue and make successful the decision, even though some of us don't agree going in. That's the Amazon disagree and commit phenomenon right there. But what people also don't understand is there are some necessary conditions to making disagree and commit work. The first mm. is that we have identified whose decision is this? Is there somebody in the group who is the final arbiter of what is the decision so that when we disagree, it can be resolved um, by that person? Second is that everybody who has a strong opinion has been heard and acknowledged and has and feels that their point of view, contrary point of view, has been understood and accepted as valid, even though we're not going to go that way. It turns out once psychologically, once you feel like you've been heard and listened to and acknowledged, you're much more willing to go along and make a different decision work. And that process is non-trivial and we often, mm -hmm. often very decisive uh, executives will just skip to the end and you get people sort of grumbling um, quietly or, or complaining or even doing what's called a pocket veto outside the meeting. Uh, pocket veto is where you don't agree with the decision and you're not going to implement the decision, but you keep it in your pocket during the meeting and you, say, and you nod your head and try, try not to say out loud what you're thinking, but you have no intention of going along. Wow. So you, in, in essence, sabotage or, you know, you, whatever you might do later on, you don't do, you agree to do something and you don't do it later on. That's really interesting, isn't it? So you're sort of effectively talking about alignment as being more of a journey rather than a destination. So like if you're a leader, you expect alignment, something to happen. It's a thing I want to happen. I need alignment right now. But the reality is, is you need to go on that journey to get to that point where people have had their say as, as to what's going on. That's right. And I, and I really like your, um, your dinner analogy there as well, because it's also not about compromise, is it? Because fish pizza is never very good, right? <laughs> Nobody wants fish pizza. And that's not going to make the fish people happy. It's not going to make the pizza people happy, is no, it right. really? So right. it's also not about compromise as well. It's about having that 
open discussion about what you're going to do, listening to the reasons why yeah. and why not it should happen, but still coming to a definitive conclusion anyway along along that journey. Sometimes relating this to to the product discipline, you've got a CPO or a VP of product who's a member of the executive team, and yeah. they feel like their job is to go around and poll everyone from the different who heads up all the different departments and get a laundry list of things they want the product team to execute and put on put on the roadmap. And so there's some marketing stuff and some sales stuff and some finance stuff. And we end up with fish pizza. We end up with a little bit of everything and nothing that really makes a difference for the business. In my mind, the, mm. the job of product is to make impact for the customers and for the business as a consequence. And yeah. if you're just giving a little bit to everyone by voting or by sort of allocation, uh, that's not a clear strategy. That's not moving the company meaningfully in the, di in the direction that you want to take it. Yeah, that's just, in essence, it's a different, that's, that's again, appeasement, isn't it? It's a very different thing again. It's very not having that boldness in terms of making a choice about where you want to take it. And I think what's interesting about how you talk about that is you mentioned it's product, but that could equally be any other division Absolutely. in the business from human resources to sales. If again, if you're still, if any, any divisions producing fish pizza, if. you know, something's wrong, right? That, that it's, it's never going to be something that's decisive or is going to really push the business forward. It ends up being just in essence, a compromise. So I really like that idea that alignment is about coming up with something that is based around a vision that people are bought into, that everybody's happy with that destination, not everybody feels like they've compromised this along the route and you end up with something that nobody really likes that much, but everybody's not that unhappy with it, they veto it. So that's a really nice way to think about it. Now, there's a, a few signs that you may not have achieved alignment that I think it's important that mm -hmm. executive wa executives watch out for. If you're the sort of person, and I've been this, uh, this sort of person who says, so we all agree, right? And everyone around the room goes, um, yeah, sure. Okay. Then you may be in danger of having what's called shallow alignment or false alignment. And the way you can detect that is, if you learn through the grapevine that after everyone left the room, some people complained loudly about the process or about not being heard or about the stupid idea that they're forced to go along with, or uh, this happened in one particular um, company that I was working with, one executive came out of a, a meeting where the, the team had agreed on four objectives and had ranked them in order and agreed that they were going to pursue all of them this quarter, left the room, went directly to his director's meeting, his staff meeting, wrote the four on a whiteboard and crossed two of them off and said, ignore these. So direct contradiction of what they had just agreed to in the previous meeting because they didn't feel safe bringing up their concerns or objections yeah. about the ability to execute on all four. I, I've totally been in those situations. I used to be an elementary school teacher and I remember we were taught very early on to not, if you ask direct questions that to any human, like, do you understand or do you agree? There's an immense amount of pressure on there, on that question for Just the answer to be this. right. Okay. Even if you don't, there's an inbuilt part of our brain that makes us want to agree and be part of this. So we, and want to seem like we're understanding. So we're very often quite scared to, to say no in those situations because no is quite a strong word. Yeah. And so you're right, it's those situations is thinking that you've got agreement as the leader in that situation means you might not have because you've not necessarily used the right tactics to get that alignment. You need to be asking and questioning, not requesting alignment. You need to be questioning along the, alongside that. So you can ask open-ended questions like, does anyone have any concerns? Not, are you disagreeing, but... Are, is there anything you worried about in trying to make this work? Or you could do what's called a pre-mortem. You could say, okay, so here's the, we, we, we've agreed on the plan. Now let's de-risk this plan. What could go wrong? If we were to have failed, if, if we had this meeting at the end of the quarter and we, we ruefully look back and say, oh, we failed, what would probably be the cause? And then get people to proactively identify their worries or their contrary opinions, even um, if this happened, we'd really be screwed. So let's mm -hmm. either examine our assumptions and decide, you know what, our plan 
cannot protect us against that, that inevitability or that possibility, so we need a different plan. Or less radically, let's at least work to mitigate it in advance if that were to occur. I do almost making it like game-like or taking people a little bit out of themselves to, so if this were to go wrong, what would it be rather than making that personal, necessarily, not attack, but because it can often get like that, can't it, in these situations where this is my idea, this is my strategy, this yes. is my initiative. Yes. I'm, you know, and for you to disagree, often I can be seen to take that personally. Right. And equally, if I think I'm disagreeing with you, that's me or disagreeing with the idea, I, you know, it might come across or I'm worried it's going to come across that I'm disagreeing with you, especially if you're the leader, you're the CEO, right? Nobody wants to be that person that is like that. So by creating a safe space, by making it more of a game yes. or making it more hypothetical, yes. in essence, what you're doing is just removing that. We're just that gaming this out. It is, as you say, it's a game or it's a hypothetical. The other thing you can do to try to disarm people's defense mechanisms in order to get them to really say what they're thinking is suppose you yourself have some concerns mm. or some criticism of an idea that someone put out. You don't want to come out and say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, and you're an idiot. So oh. the first thing is, don't talk about the person, talk about the idea. But the second thing yeah. is, first, summarize the idea and highlight the positives. I think what you're saying is this, 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 and therefore that. Is that right? Get them to acknowledge that you've understood them. Okay, I can see why you, why you think this is a good idea. It's got this advantage and that advantage and the other advantage. What I think I am also aware of, so this is yes and, yeah. is the risk that over here, this other thing that we haven't talked about. Or what you might not know is, insert facts here that the person well, might not be aware of. Not or there is this other consideration, you know, and so add rather than contradict, but start with the summary and an acknowledgement of the positives. When you do that, when someone feels acknowledged and heard, you gain their permission to say what you think because they, they feel like you gave them the airtime, you gave them the acknowledgement, now they want to return the favor. That again is a sort of a normal psychological phenomenon. We're wired for fairness. And so we, we, we tend to respond well in that situation. No, I really like that approach. It reminds me a lot of actually the, the CEOs I work with who have challenging relationships with their board of directors where it can end up becoming like this. And what's interesting as to what I hear, certainly from the people who can make it more confrontation in those situations, they're like, well, everybody's an adult here. We don't need to worry about people's feelings. We're all you know, very senior executives for all these times. But the reality is, is no matter how old you are, how much experience you have, those feelings are still under the surface. Right. And you, you need to respect the human there in terms of doing that. And it doesn't have to be confrontational. All it really ends up being is just like you say, is, is acknowledging what that person said rather than what they often can hear is your criticism is like the whole idea when rather the reality is it's just this small area of the idea that you maybe you want to talk about in more detail. But just having, choosing, having and choosing the right words in those sorts of situations can make it so it doesn't escalate into anything that's more that's right. challenging in those situations. Even if it may not come across like that, that may be the underlying feeling in the room, which is the last thing that you want. The other people in the room, they, as you say, they have all of those emotions. If they really are mature, experienced executives, they may be better than average at managing those emotions, but you can help them manage them by using these kinds of approaches in mm -hmm. communication, by making it easy for them to manage their own defensiveness or attachment to the idea and to enter into a hypothetical game-like conversation yeah. where we're going to get to the, a better result. And after all, that is what we're after when we're moving our team toward alignment is the best decision, not I win and you lose. I like that. And so that's the idea that it's not a win-lose situation. This is something that is, I'm not attached to my idea or myself being right. I want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And it's just that subtle viewpoint shift that separating the individual out from the idea both in terms of the, you know, in conceptually, what you might agree with that, but the reality is if the language isn't around that, right. then it's not necessarily happening. There's a sort of a interesting sort of dance that we're doing where that you can actually yeah. imagine happening with posture and with how we face one another. So if we're ever in an argument, 
we are face to face and I'm like, this is my point. And you're like making a point back at me. And it's mm. like a fight. But imagine yeah. that instead we are both facing toward the problem and we are mm. cooperating and collaborating to find the best answer. And so we're whiteboarding. And then I, I put some things on the whiteboard and I hand you the marker and you, you add to that. Right. And we're like, oh, okay, right. Yeah, I see, I see where you're going with this. And we're side by side uh, facing the problem rather than facing each other. That's a really nice way to think about it. So I've got something here, right? I'm a busy person, Bruce. This sounds like a long process. Can we just do this quickly, right? How do you do, can you do this quickly? And if so, how do you do this quickly? It sounds like this is long. I'm busy. I'm too busy for this. Can yeah. we just do it quickly? I mean, I, I think there's a huge value in spending some time doing a workshop with your team. That's what I do with product teams and with executive teams is we sit down for half a day or a couple of half a days and we map out their OKRs or their roadmap and we figure out what, what the team cross-functionally as a whole are going to agree on. So I, I think that periodically, not every day, but periodically, like once a quarter, you do need to sit down with your whole team and figure out what the plan is and align on it, whatever construct that you use. But day to day. And whatever level you're at as well, because again, like you say, people, especially in the C-suite, well, I'm, I'm too busy for that. But the reality is, is, it sounds like if you don't put that effort in to create that alignment, that's right. It's just going to come back and bite you later on down the line, right? For the sake of half a day or a day of time, how much time that will save you further on down process in terms of what could go wrong later on. I worked with this one company over two years on where, with the executive team on their quarterly OKRs. And the thing that got them from a bunch of sort of departmental siloed OKRs that really did not add up to more than the sum of the parts, they ended up adding, adding up to less than the sum of the parts because they weren't very, they didn't make a lot of progress in achieving those goals. The thing that drove them to one shared OKR for the entire C-suite and much more success in achieving that was spending time together. Every quarter mm -hmm. we had a two day, two half days, one after the other uh, offsite where they all came together and we spent time together working through this stuff. And uh, gradually they moved from a bunch of high powered professionals to a team. And that made all the difference in their ability to make the changes that they needed to in their organization for it to succeed. So I, I want to come back to your point about how do we do this quickly? First, I would say, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you really do need to spend the time to form as a team. But then having done that, they can, they, they also have a, you know, a weekly staff meeting and it's, it's quick and agenda driven. Um, and they've got to try to get through a bunch of things and they've got to make decisions quickly. Number one, you can make decisions quickly as a group. If the key people have had some key conversations one-on-one -on -one outside the group first, that's what I call okay. shuttle diplomacy, where somebody who mm -hmm. owns something, a decision say, um, and wants to, wants to drive that decision and get alignment on that decision through the rest of the team spends a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time maybe only 20 minutes, maybe 10 minutes in the hallway or at the coffee machine uh, or on a video like this uh, with the key people who they know will have a strong opinion. Coming to a, a uh, mutual understanding and using the constructs that we talked about, like, here's what I'm thinking, but I want to understand your point of view. And now I'm going to shut up and let you talk. And I'm going to give you some airtime and I'm going to say, okay, I hear you. And I'm going to repeat back to you what you, what you said in my own words and ask you, did I get that right? No, I really like that approach. It's the idea. I like the, I like the concept of shuttle diplomacy as well. That's, that's nice because it gives you, you're, you're almost looking ahead for where the problems are going to be or where the challenges may be with certain individuals because you know their point of view is right. going to be different or right. you're going to need some time with them or they're going to need extra time with you. And you just, you, you offset that really by spending, again, investing some time in doing that. And it, again, Executives busy, hard to get time on the calendar, but um, you could have, especially with a little bit of re repetition and practice, you could have that quick pre-alignment shuttle diplomacy conversation in 15 minutes. 
That's a really great idea. So how me as a leader of this, if I'm the CEO, how do I how do I orchestrate that? How do I make sure that happens? How do I how can I be sure that my executive team is doing that? What sort of mm. how can that happen, do you think? Well, the first thing I think is it comes down to objectives. I talked to a CEO of a small semiconductor company. They had been making chips for 25 years. He'd been CEO the entire time. And they had just this amazing, consistent 40% growth rate every year for 25 years. And wow. I, uh, so I naturally, I was curious. I asked him, what was the secret? And the first thing he said was not fantastic technology or, you know, the smartest team in the mm -hmm. world or things that you might expect him to say. He said, my executive team shares 80% the same objectives. Yeah, there are a few things here and there on the edges, but 80%, the marketing person, the salesperson, the engineering, they all have the same set of objectives. So that forces yeah. alignment because we're, we're, really we've all got the correct. same incentives. Yeah. And you're all going in the same direction, aren't you, as well? You know, you're going because you're working towards the same goal. They're not separate goals or separate ideas or separate objectives that may at some level linked together, they're very fundamentally right. the same things, which is a really nice way to do it. So it, in essence, it encourages them. It's the carrot way of doing it, isn't it really? If they're all working towards the same thing, there's an encouragement for there to work together rather than the potential the other one, which is the stick, which is like, you guys have just got to align on this. You know, that kind of frustration that can often come yeah. that ends up being, well, what does that mean? How do we do that? And the reality is, is if everything, if people have the same shared objectives, that alignment can happen. Yeah. That's a really nice, straightforward way to look at it. The other thing is so, I, I really encourage CEOs to, to reserve the substantive discussion for the things that are common across the team, for those shared goals, for, the, for that let's bring together the brain trust and figure out how we're going to solve this problem that faces us as a business that isn't departmentally specific. A lot of executive team meetings that I've been in, they're just kind of a status update on the, on the latest performance statistics or deliverables for each department. Marketing says we generated this many qualified leads. Sales says this is what the pipeline looks like, et cetera. And I think I'm just so bored with that. And it feels like every department, when they are presenting, all the other departments are bored too. And and I think maybe we should just jettison that, trust that the departments and their department heads know what they're doing until proven otherwise, publish the, the numbers and the update as a pre-read, and then reserve the actual live group discussion for, okay, there are these macro trends in our business that are changing and they're driving down our margins incredibly. What are we going to do about that? That's not... That's not a departmental discussion. That's a company strategy discussion. And that's where you want all brains on deck, right? So you're addressing the things that matter at that point, right? Like you say, it's not a status update. It's not, because again, that can happen. A handout can be done beforehand. It's really looking at right. what do we need to align on right now? What are the issues that we're facing out there? What are the challenges that we got? It's, it's again, it's in essence, small alignment, isn't it? Alignment through these constant meetings you're making sure that everything's going in the right direction rather than it being talk me through the numbers that's a different way to look at it and i like that there was so you mentioned that i'm going to ask you another question so you mentioned that that business that's doing very very well yeah what does it look like then when you have alignment we talked a lot about when you don't have it yeah what what's possible when you do and what what do, what do businesses look like when they are aligned what does it see how, how do they act what's different yeah oh well let's start with what's what's a sign of misalignment. I told you, you know, sort of behaviorally okay. what to expect, but in terms of results, imagine mm -hmm. you're in a situation where you think, you know, what your market is, who, who your buyer is, and you know, and you, your product seems reasonably well suited to it. And you have a high powered sales team and you have a marketing effort and everything you've checked all the boxes that seem to put this machine into good motion. And yet it's just not really getting momentum. Every, you know, it feels like making the numbers quarter after quarter is such a slog, is such a mm. struggle 
And you're always worried right until the last minute of whether you're gonna make it. And sometimes you don't. Your sales cycles are longer than they should be. Your conversion rates are lower than they should be. Your retention is lower than it should be. Everything is kind of an uphill battle. That, to me, suggests that there isn't clear alignment among those functions about what the definition of success is, about what the goal is. Well, let me play out just a real practical example. There was an argument in this one C-suite between the CMO and the CPO about who is the ideal customer? What is our market and what is the TAM for that market? And the, uh, the CMO said, look, I know I can make my numbers if we define it fairly broadly like this, I know I can generate the number of qualified leads that we need in order to close business and hit our numbers. I've done all the math back to front from lead generation and awareness generation all the way through to closed business and average sale. And that's the only way I can make it work. And the CPO said, let's fine, except that our product, that, that TAM is so broad, our product cannot really adequately service all of those diverse needs in that business. And so when we go up, when we go for an RFP, we're not gonna be able to really compete with the full checklist of the other companies in that space. And when we actually onboard those customers, they're going to be disappointed and complain, and we're going to have churn. Oh. And so the numbers might look good on paper, but I don't think we can actually achieve that. And lo and behold, that was what was really happening was that they were, they were their close rate was low. They had to discount and their retention. I guess I'm thinking the CMO at that point is thinking, well, that's not my problem. Or, you know, at some level, that's what's going on in their head, right? right. That's your problem, not mine. Well, and yeah. we felt the pressure back from the CPO saying, Sorry. I think we need to narrow our definition of our target yeah. market. And he, but, but his reaction was kind of panic. I can't make my numbers if we narrow it like mm. that, and that's what I'm paid to do. So the only remedy for that was the CEO stepping in and saying, all right, we're changing the playing field. We're going to agree on a, on a definition of the target market that we can really compete in and nail, and CMO, we're gonna change your comp plan and, your, and, the, and the numbers you need to hit to match that. And then that fixed it. And then you have that alignment there. But it's only by that coming out and having those conversations and having the space for that to happen that you see that, right? Mm. Rather than what could taking that example further, where the CMO is like, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm passing the, I'm passing the numbers over. It's, it's that person, it's that guy's fault. Oh, that yeah. They're not convinced. It's not my problem. Right. It's, it's them, right? right? And you can see immediately that there's, there's no alignment there. Right? You can see it because there isn't. It's like I'm throwing these customers over the wall to you. If you're not catching them, well, that's your problem, right? But the reality is, is it, that's not the best way to do it. Well, and it took the CEO um, with a little bit of en outside encouragement, stepping in for the CMO to go to the rest of the executive team and to the CEO and say, I want relief from my quota, would feel like an admission of failure. And he was in a position where it was really hard to ask for that. And yeah, because you couldn't say, yeah, you, it's very hard to say that I don't think I'm going to hit these numbers. I, you know, rather than the numbers being wrong, you worry that the challenge is that I'm somehow not doing my job right. or something like that. It becomes back to that emotional, personal aspect of it that seems to get in the way of this alignment, right? Is that these the things are operating. We'd love these things to be operating in a tangible, human, objective way. But the reality is a lot of this stuff happens in a very subjective way anyway. And it takes acknowledgement of that. Yep for things to actually change, right? If you don't acknowledge that subjective, emotional, human element of this, you're not going to get the alignment. You're not going to do it. You're just going to carry on in these sorts of situations where you're living in a different world. So I get, I, I get hired by companies to help with things like frameworks with, we need, we need to do our OKRs or we need to do a roadmap or we need the team needs some training or we need to hire uh, a new CPO or something like that. Very sort of easily defined, technical in a way, sort of things that, that they need. But in the end, we always end up dealing with the human dimension. That's really what's going on. All these things like we were not good at a roadmap. It's a symptom of, or of cultural, organizational, human problems. 
it turns out the hardest thing in tech is people. And that's that's the reality, I think, of a lot of the world, a lot of this work in is all business problems are human problems, that's right? True. They are at the end of the day, because they are the humans make up the people that deliver it, the people that buy it, the people that sell it. You can't ignore that part of it. However much you'd like it to be a machine, it can never be quite like that because the humans are yeah. an intrinsic part of that. I love that. Well, and it turns out that if you harness that though, that that's where the genius comes from. You know, once um once freed from the constraints of the initial setup, this executive team has become really tight knit. Really, uh, they act like friends rather than um, colleagues, and that's that's what you want. And that's that that sounds like then. So these are some of the signals you can see when you have got alignment. Then, or people are working towards that. Is that's one of the signs is a strong working relationship amongst the C suite. What are the other things that you notice when you have alignment? What are the other benefits you get when that yeah. alignment's there? How can you recognize it when you have it? First of all, I would expect to see an improvement in your business results um, because there, because you've got the focus and alignment on your team and you're, you're, so you've got alignment on exactly who is the customer and what is the pitch to that customer. And we can fulfill those promises to that customer. And so your conversion rate goes up and your, your sales cycle goes down and your retention rate goes up all of that, all of those business things, but those can be lagging indicators. It's going to take some time. The leading indicators would be that you see the executives helping each other out. That is, you mm -hmm. see them working each other's problems rather than just saying, well, I did my part uh, and now I'm done. I, I stood up, I gave my update and now I'm sitting down. You have an engaged conversation, first of all, in the executive team, but you see you see them, you, you oh. just hear someone saying parenthetically, yeah, Dave and I were talking about this the other day and we worked out a solution. Somebody from my team is going to spend three months on their team helping them out, figuring out this problem. And uh, we're optimistic that, the, that these guys can work it out. That sounds like the perfect situation, right? If you're a leader and a CEO, that's exactly what you want. The number's up, people proactively out there encouraging and solving problems. That sounds like it's the, the answer. Fantastic. Right. Right. It, mm. As a CEO, I mean, I run my own small business. The, I keep telling my own team um, that the best thing that can, the best news I can possibly have is we uh, identified this problem and we figured it out. Here's, here's what we've done right. or here's what we're doing. Um, and I'm like, great. I have nothing to do. I love that. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Bruce. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, how can people learn more about this particular subject, this alignment approach from you and from in the world? How, how can people learn more? Thank you for asking. I have just finished, just about finished writing a book about stakeholder alignment and it's called Aligned. Um, it's geared toward product leaders, but it's really applicable, honestly, to any function. It's in my mind, it's sort of the, um, the missing manual for how to get beyond the mere skills of your job to actually being effective by gaining alignment throughout your organization. Oh. It's a combination of a business book uh, with a bunch of tools, tips, frameworks, very practical, very actionable, and a fable, a story about someone mm -hmm. new joining an organization at the director level and gradually figuring out their, um, the landscape, the politics, the hidden landscape behind the matrix um, and uh, working their way up into the C-suite. That sounds fantastic. Great. And so by the time of publishing this, the book will be out. So where, where's the best place to go and find the book? Yeah, um, go Somewhere to amazon.com and it's called Aligned Stakeholder Management for Product Leaders by myself and my co-author, um, Melissa Appel. Um, or um, I don't know if you have show notes, but we can provide a link. Yeah, a link to what's what's the website where where can people find you i'm at productculture.com there's also a landing page there about the book with more details thanks again for your time bruce i've really enjoyed our conversation